Hello everyone and welcome back for the next exciting installment of our tutorial videos and this time we're going to talk about the binomial distribution and as is kind of becoming our practice here what we'll do is a, a pretty brief lecture on just the facts of the binomial distribution definitions and what have you and then we'll jump into Excel and I'll walk us through some examples of applying it using the Excel tools and then we'll have a separate homework tutorial where I walk us through some homework problems and we'll do those all together to just get some practice and then you'll have a couple to do on your own. Okay, so let's dive right in and, and start to understand what the binomial distribution is. Here's the definition from the textbook. Binomial distribution is a discrete distribution that can occur in two situations. When sampling with a population with only two types of members, okay, so males and females, college grad, non-college grad, urban versus rural, just think about categorizing the subject matter of interest into only two categories. Or when performing a sequence of identical experiments that has only two possible outcomes, like a coin flip, or uh, it could be a, a sports situation where you could win or lose. It could be a business situation where you can, you can succeed or fail to meet a particular uh, sales target, let's say. You get a sense for where the name binomial comes from. There's only two possible outcomes for an event rather than a, an array of possible outcomes or variables. Like for instance, when we talk about the normal distribution, we talked about the distribution of heights that could you know, take a wide array of values from pretty much the shortest person ever up to the tallest person ever and anything in between. Well, here we're just talking about two possibilities. So in a, in a sense, it's a simpler distribution, but in, in another sense, which we'll look at, it works a lot like the normal distribution. Here's how we'll set up binomial distribution situations. Consider a situation in which there are n independent identical trials of some occurrence, some activity, and this is known in statistics as the IID assumption, independent identically distributed um, variables. So they're totally independent of each other. The probability of success, and notice I put that in quotes, so it doesn't have to be success-failure dichotomy. You can just be, there's, there's one outcome over here, then there's the other outcome over there. So outcome one versus outcome two. The probability of success on each trial is P, and the probability of a failure is one minus P. And, and that, if you remember back to our probability discussion, that's, um, that's exhaustive. We've covered all possible outcomes in just those two options, success slash failure or outcome one slash outcome two. X is the random number of successes in the n trials. X has a binomial distribution with parameters n and p. Now, okay, and I know that that sounded like a bunch of stat gobbledygook, but it'll become clear, I think, when we start to think in terms of a concrete example. So think about a coin flip. You flip a coin 100 times, what's the probability of getting X number of heads? 50 times, 10 times, 90 times, 100 times, you know? Of course, we know the probability of getting uh, 50 heads is going to be larger than the probability of getting 100 heads. But the, what the binomial distribution will do for us is give us exact probabilities based on if we, had, if we ran this simulation over and over and over again, what would be our expected probabilities of each outcome. Okay, So the parameters in the number of times we're flipping the coin, that's the number of uh, trials of our situation, experiment, what have you. X is... I'll, I call it the test value. Whatever we want it to be, we can set that at any number between 0 and n. So we could say, what's the probability of getting 0 heads? x set to 0. What's the probability of getting 50 heads? x equals 50. What's the probability of getting 100 heads? x equals 100. Okay. So we'll, we'll dial that in wherever we want it to be. That's our test value. P, now for flipping a coin, we know that already, don't we? If it's a fair coin, what's the probability of getting a head? 0.5, same as the probability of getting a tail. The probability will be a known variable, and we'll, we'll usually base it off of some kind of base rate uh, data that we already have in hand going into an analysis situation. Okay, we've got the setup, and in just a few minutes we'll jump into Excel and start working through problems with that, that kind of framework and those concepts in mind to plug into Excel's formulas. There's a few more things that we should talk about about the characteristics of the distribution first before we jump into Excel. Mean and standard deviation of binomial distribution, a little bit different from the normal distribution. Mean is simply defined as n, which is the number of trials times p, times probability. So for instance, in a coin flip, let's say our n equals 2, 2 trials, times the probability of getting heads, which is 0.5. Think about it, if you flipped a coin twice, what would your expected number of heads be? Half of the times it winds up heads, half of the time it winds up tails. 2 times 0.5 equals 1. Okay. So that's pretty intuitive. Okay, now the standard deviation 
is a, a little uh, different than what we're used to. It's defined as that this is just the, uh, the, the mean times 1 minus the probability. And don't ask me for the, um, for the math on this. I'm not too familiar with it, but we'll just run with it. We just uh, know, and then we take the square root of that. So square root of the mean times 1 minus the base rate probability gives us the standard deviation. Now, what's interesting about a binomial distribution is that fo it follows empirical rules that by now we're very familiar with. In other words, about 68% of outcomes are going to be within plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean, and 95 are going to be within plus or minus two uh, sigma of the mean, and almost all of them, basically 99.7 technically, are going to be within plus or minus three sigma, three standard deviation of the mean. Now, remember that in the context of a normal distribution, we draw it like this, our, our classic bell curve, here's our mean, or our expected value of x, right, and then we go plus and minus one sigma, and that's got 68% of occurrences in here, below the curve, plus and minus two sigma has 95%, right, that's this whole area under the curve here, and then plus and minus three sigma has everything almost everything, uh, you know, approximately 100%. So what does that mean if the empirical rules apply to a binomial distribution just as well as they do to a normal distribution? Yeah, you got it. That means a binomial distribution is approximately the same as a normal distribution under certain circumstances, and that's when n is large, roughly 30 or above, and then the p-value for the base rate for the binomial distribution, we want it to not be extreme, either really close to one or really close to zero. So if your p-value is somewhere in the middle between zero and one, and your number of trials of the scenario is, is somewhat large, you're basically going to have a normal distribution of possible outcomes. And that'll be really easy to see once we jump into Excel and start doing some examples. Because we'll, we'll build a histogram out of our results, and you'll see that, oh yeah, bell-shaped, normal type looking distribution. Okay, and speaking of Excel, there's only one more thing I want to do before we jump into Excel, and that's to run through how the binomial distribution functions work in Excel. So what we're going to do is this equals binom.dist, and then Excel tells you the arguments that you need to put in there. Number s, number underscore s, that's the number of successes, s for successes. Remember, successes, don't read that normatively, just whatever outcome we're interested in tracking, outcome one as opposed to outcome two. Trials, of course, is our n. Probability is s, that's our base rate probability of whatever outcome we're interested in tracking. And then cumulative, I'll walk you through that, That's uh, that can take a value of zero or one. That tells us how rigorously we want to specify the outcome. Okay, so number of successes in trials, probability s, the base rate probability. Cumulative, it's set to zero or false. You can type in either one in Excel, and that means exactly k successes, the, exactly this number of successes. So what's the probability of getting exactly that many successes in the binomial distribution? Or we can type in one or the word true. That means less than or equal to that many successes. And you'll see there's an example in which we'll use uh, both of them, and you'll see how they differ. Uh, but for, for most cases, we'll be going with that exact convention. We'll be typing in zero in Excel. But there's a couple others in which we won't, so just keep that in mind. Okay, and then finally, we'll in a few instances, we'll be using the binom.inverse. This works the same way as the norm.inverse did for normal distributions. And what, we, what we're doing here is, instead of trying to find the, the probability of a certain event, or cumulatively up to and including a certain outcome, we have a probability, or more properly speaking, a percentile, and we want to find the value, the expected value of the distribution at that percentile. And so the only thing we add here, okay, we have the number of trials, that's, that's the n, the probability of s, that's the base rate p. Alpha is the um, whatever percentile we're interested. So we could set in, we could put that at 0 0.5, 50th percentile, 0 0.95, you know, there's our 5% our, uh, significance level which we'll talk a lot more about when we get into uh, hypothesis testing. So I'll show you how that works in Excel, and hopefully it'll make uh, a little more sense once we get there. Okay, so we're jumping over into Excel, and we're going to work through some examples. One, I like to just kind of make up my own examples so I can work through the, the concept and, and make sure I really understand it. And we'll do that first, and then we'll grab a few from the book that are really uh, useful as well. And so I got to thinking, um, 
where does the binomial distribution apply? Well, it, it often applies in sports when you think about an outcome being binomial, make or miss. So take, for example, basketball, where you players uh, take a shot and they either make or miss. And then you start to think about what, what's the probability, what are the chances of a certain player making a certain number of shots in a row? Or what's, what's the chances of a player making a certain number of shots you know, in a game? Something like that. So I said, let's think about the binomial distribution Let's, let's apply the binom binomial distribution to free throws, free throw percentages in basketball. And to make it more illustrative, we'll go back to our old example of uh, Shaquille O'Neal. Ah! dare to wake me? So I knew that uh, Shaq was a pretty bad free throw shooter. Of course, that wasn't his job, although a lot of um, opponents realize that took advantage of that. Uh, I got to thinking, you know, what are the, what's the chances of Shaq making a certain number of free throws in a row? So we can actually use the binomial distribution to work that out. So I'm just going to type in what we're looking for here. Shaq making X free throw in a... What we need is the base rate percentage. So Shaq's um, free throws percentage, which would be our P. I didn't know what that was off the top of my head, so I went and looked, and here I found on Sports Illustrated I just typed in worst free throw shooters ever, and there's Shaq at 52.7. He's actually not the worst all time. Ben Wallace and Andre Drummond, both with the Pistons, way down to 38%, Andre Drummond. So could be worse, you know. But Shaq was pretty well known as not being a great uh, shooter, free throw shooter. So 52.7, which will enter as 0.527. And then the way I want to set this up is just we'll adjust different uh, values of x, and we'll find that probability. We'll find the probability of x. And we'll set up a little table here, and we'll use a binomial distribution to calculate these percentages. What's the probability that Shaq's going to make one free throw in a row? Well, that's just going to be his base rate probability, isn't it? But let's let's plug it into the binomial distribution calculation in Excel. And here's how it works. We're going to type in binom.dist. Open the parentheses, and then you'll see the arguments that we just talked about. Number of successes. Well, that's one, so we'll just use cell reference for that. Number of trials. We're looking at in a row, so we're saying one out of one. That's going to be H5 again. The probability, that's our base rate, G4. And then whether we want cumulative or not, and uh, remember we said zero is not cumulative. This The exact number, one is cumulative, so we'll go with zero for now. You could also type in false. And of course, that's going to be equal to the base rate, isn't it? And let's go ahead and express this as percentage. So, uh, with one decimal. So, that's totally logical. But now let's think about what if it's two? What's Shaq's probability of making two in a row? And so, what I want to do is drag that down. Now, why is it coming up zero? I need to make a little correction in here. Uh, what I need to do is uh, lock that cell reference for the free throw percentage. So, I'm going to put G dollar sign four. So, when we slide the formula down, yeah, now our, our number of successes and trials is both cell reference here to, to 2, but our base rate percentage is still what we entered up here. So we could actually now uh, drag down, let's do it through say 10, and by the way, you don't have to go and type 3, 4, 5. Um, Excel can predict what you want if you just drag the 1 and 2, and then drag those down, and you'll see Excel is going to put 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 for us, smart filling. And then of course we can fill this one down too. And we'll see that that probability of Shaq making that many in a row, we're saying we, what's the probability of him making 3 out of 3, 4 out of 4, 5 out of 5, etc., 10 out of 10, is extremely low, 0.2% for Shaq hitting 10 in a row. It's pretty low for him even hitting 4 or 5 in a row, because his, his base rate is so bad. It's, you know, eight, 4 to 8% for hitting 4 or 5 in a row. Okay, so that's how we can use that binomial distribution to put an exact number on that, assuming that base rate, assuming they're independently distributed, and that's that might be a little bit of a stretch. There's actually the textbook has an example where they go into this: do, do players get hot? You know, do they go on streaks where they, you know, m making more shots causes them to causes their base rate percentage to go up, or missing shots causes that base rate to go down. So you know, we could kind of debate that and and discuss whether the independent assumption is accurate, but let's just run with it for now. I want to now think about uh, someone with a different base rate and, and think about the same kind of probability. So I went to online and I said, who are the greatest free throws ever? And uh, Steph Curry is near the top. He's actually not the best ever. Um, he's got to notice his uh, free throw percentage here of 90%. 
pretty darn good, and it doesn't get much better than that. The the guys above him, Mark Price, he's only 0.4 points higher, and then Steve Nash, he's only 0.4, 90.4. So we might as well go with uh, Stephen Curry at 90% here. So let's plug him in and do the same calculation for him. This is where we set up the same kind of table. Curry's free throw base percentage, his, the P, and that was 0.9 for him. And then we'll do the same thing with X and the probability of X, and this being the, sh the number of shots made in a row. Then we'll set up that binom.dist function again. Number of successes equals one in the cell. The number of trials is again the cell. <clears throat> now remember, we want to lock this probability in this time. And then do we want to go cumulative or not? No, we want to go uh, zero for false. And you see uh, that, of course, Curry's probability of getting one is his base rate probability. And what's Curry's probability of getting two in a row? It's his base rate probability times his base rate probability all the way down. And we see that Curry actually has a pretty decent shot of making 10 in a row with a, with a base rate as high as 0 0.9, 90%. He's got more than a third chance of getting 10 in a row. Okay, so there's a difference between a 52% and a 90% shooter. Okay, but there's a lot more we can do, so let's do something else here. I want to think about uh, the probability of Shaq making N out of Y free throws. And what I mean by this is that so a specified number of free throws out of a given um, number of shots. So let's set up the P again. And we, that's 0.527. And then this time I'll specify the Y and I'll say, let's say how many free throws does he make out of out of a given 10? You know, and what number should we use? Or we might say, well, what's his average number of free throws per game? You know, what if he gets, you know, maybe he got 10 free throws per game. That'd be five fouls. Um, imagine he probably actually got more than that. But let's say he gets fouled five times. He gets two shots per foul. So he averages 10 free throws per game. So this would basically be the per game free throws. Well, same thing now. We're going to go we'll put our N here. You know, let's call this, um, let's not confuse our terminology. Let's call this x out of y. So we can use similar terminology. And we'll call this our x again. And then we'll call this our probability of x again. So x out of y, where y is defined as 10, and then x is going to just vary all the possible outcomes, which would be 1 through 10, of course. And again, we'll uh, select both of those and smart fill it down to 10. Okay, so the way we want to set this up equals binom.dist. Number of successes is going to be um, the cell reference here. And this time I'm going to lock this one in because uh, this will just save me a little time because we're going to do something else in addition to just finding these raw probabilities. The number of trials now is the what we specified over here for the Y. And again, I'm going to lock that. The probability, that's the base rate, that's our p-value. I'm going to lock that as well. And actually, I didn't mean to lock in my row there, just my column. And then 0 or 1, for cumulative or not. And we're going to go with uh, 0, not cumulative, for now. OK, and notice now, the probability of Shaq getting just 1 out of 10, this is what we're saying. This is probably of him getting 1 out of 10 in any given you know set of 10, any given game, let's say. And that's pretty low because he's a 52% shooter, so he's his expected value is you know some, a little bit more than five actually. So it's going to be pretty rare that he just gets one. And in fact, as we increase this, let's go up to five, we'll see that that outcome becomes much more likely. Now, why is the probability of him getting five not 100%? It's because we're looking at all the possible outcomes. He could get just one. He could get two. He could get three, four, five. Now, five is a pretty common outcome, but so is four. And so is 6. And when we complete this, we'll see that the most common outcomes are clustered around the expected value. The probability of Shaq getting 4, 5, or 6 are the most common outcomes. And then the, you know, as we get closer to him having a really good night, that becomes more and more rare. Up to the probability of him getting 10 in a row, that's only 0.17. That's, almost, that's kind of on the order of him only getting 1. So these are extreme rare events. And towards the middle here are clustered the more common events. Now, where can we go with I'm going to select the probability values and make a just a basic bar chart out of it. And this is actually a histogram now of Shaq's 
free throw outcomes. And let's put a good title on this. This is the probability Shaq making X out of 10 free throws. And what does it look like? Kind of looks like a normal bell-shaped distribution, doesn't it? And that's pretty much what it is. Now, we've got a pretty low uh, N here. I've set, I set N equal to 10, but nonetheless, we see that it's pretty normal. Let's, let's go with the convention from the book. Okay, so let's go ahead and increase that all the way to 30, and then go ahead and find the cumulative percentages for each one there. And now, ah, we see that they're clustered around right around the middle of that, about the halfway point, the 50% mark, right, which is about what his base rate is. And if we graph these again, histogram, we'll get even even neater looking, even more normal looking distribution. There, there it is, because now we've got that convention where the n is large, 30 or greater, and the p-value is not close to zero or 1. And right here, our p-value is smack in the middle, isn't it? So this approximates the normal distribution very well. So probability of Shaq making x out of 30 free throws. No. Okay, and that looks quite normal indeed. We do the same thing with Curry. What we'd want to do for him, instead of saying making that many in a row, we'd have to, we'd want to do, uh, let me move the Shaq histogram up here. We'd basically want it, let's copy the, the thing for Shaq, paste it over here and where we had Curry set up. And now we're just changing the base rate to 0.9, aren't we? Curry is going to be clustered up here towards the higher uh, end of the range. But if we, if we drew a histogram of this, we still, we'll still see that it's normal. It just has a mean that's much higher. It's approximating a normal distribution just with a much higher mean, which looks to be around somewhere around 27. Okay, one more quick thing I want to do on this bit on my kind of warm up example before we move on to a couple of textbook examples, and that is to think about the inverse probability function. And this is working the other way from here where we had the the number we wanted to get in a certain number of trials and the probability of getting that number to having the probability number and seeing how many trials would take us to that value. So probably the best way to think about this would be to go ahead and do the cumulative probability function first. Cumulative probability of x. And we'll just go back to Shaq and we'll do this for, uh, for Shaq's numbers. And this time I'm going to do everything the same. I'm going to take my um, distribution over here binome distribution, all the same values, and I've got the cell references locked, so when we slide this down, the only thing we'll slide is the x, the number of successes. But instead of zero, I'm going to go with one for true, meaning it's a cumulative distribution function. And now we'll see that he's got a 0% chance of making just one. He's at 0%, let's see when we get an actual number here. Yeah, okay, so 2.5, let's go, 1% chance of making nine or less. Okay, so that's the probability of getting hit this value or anything underneath it. And we'll see that these values only climb as we get higher up to 30. So we fill that the rest of the way. Okay, and once he gets to, once we get to 26, we, we're confident that Shaq is going to make 26 or less, which includes zero, right? So kind of the better way to think about this is that there's like, like a 98, 99% chance that Shaq makes... 22 or less, that means there's a 1% chance that he makes more than 22. And Shaq is kind of bad, so we'd want, kind of want to think about flipping that around. Um, do the same thing for Curry. Kind of contrast uh, the, the really good shooter versus the not so great shooter. Think about the cumulative probability of X for Curry. And the same thing here, we'll, we'll slide this over, but now instead of 0 for the um, cumulative condition, we'll put 1. And let me make sure all those arguments are correct for Curry. Yep, and then we'll slide that down. And we'll see that Curry has a 7.3% chance of only making 24. He's got a 17% chance of only making 25 or less. He's got, a, he's got an 80% chance of making 28 or less. So his, his threshold is a lot higher, meaning... You know, if, if we thought, think about these smaller numbers down here, like the 0.2% here... There's a 0.2 percent he'll make 21 21 shots out of 30 or less. Uh, that means there's a 99.8 percent chance that he's going to make more than 21 shots. Okay, so most of his probability lies down in here, whereas Shaq, you know, most of it lies, you know, 59 percent at 16 or less. So 
there's a difference in the um, cumulative probability probability density you would see between a, a mediocre and a great shooter. Okay, now that leaves one thing. What is the that inverse? Fu how does that inverse function work for us? Well, we're, we would be asking a question like this: What's the fiftieth percentile, for instance, cumulative free throw distribution? Now we can see that visually just by looking down here to find where 50% lies in the in this cumulative one. We're looking at these numbers now. And we see that 50% lies some it's somewhere between 15 and 16. Now if we didn't have that distribution set up, we could simply use the binom.inverse function and this works just like the norm inverse does to calculate a percentile for us. And the arguments are the number of trials. That is the 30. The probability of S is our base rate again. And now our alpha is the prob is the percentile value we want to cut off. 52th percentile is 0.5. And it says 16. It's going to take us the whole number to where less than that is, is inclusive, equal to or less than that is inclusive of the 50th percentile. Okay. And because this has to give us an integer, We'll notice that it's actually a little bit above the 50th percentile okay, because we can't talk, we can't make a fractional shot during a game, so we have kind of a limitation there. All right, let's do the same thing really quick for for uh, Curry equals binom dot inverse 30 trials. We can do all this with cell reference, base rate probability there, and alpha 0.5 again, and you'll see that's 27. And if we scroll down in that cumulative function, indeed, the first um, number above 50% occurs at 27 shots. Okay. So his uh, distribution sits uh, quite a bit to the right of Shaq's. All right, so there's some warm up. There's hopefully you've got the concept of what we're doing with the, how the binomial distribution works and how we can use the tools in Excel to to reckon with it. Let's do a couple book examples. I think they're really um, worthwhile. And I put the page number 191, exercise 5.7, straight out of the book, just a basic example. So um, if you don't have your book, I'll wait. Grab your book, pause the video, I'll wait, grab the book, and you can uh, follow along here with me. So the book says, suppose that 100 identical batteries are inserted in identical flashlights. Each flashlight takes a single battery. After eight hours of continuous use, a given battery is still operating with probability 0.6 or has failed with probability 0.4. Let X be the number of successes in these 100 trials, where success means that the battery is still functioning. Find the probabilities of the following events. A, 58, exactly 58 successes. B, no more than 65. C, less than 70. D, at least 59. Yada, 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 on through I. And then it says find the 95th percentile of the distribution of X. Okay, so here's how we're going to set this up. We're going to dial in a couple things right off the bat. Number of trials, 100 and our base rate probability success for each trial. Remember the book said that was uh, 0.6 so let's dial that in. There's a whole bunch of events that the book gives us and we want to find their probabilities. So exactly 58 successes. Okay. Then how are we going to set that up? Well we're going to use our standby binom.dist and then we'll just uh, either type in values or grab them from cell reference. And the number of successes, we'll just type that in, 58, whoops, 58. The number of trials, we'll grab a cell reference up here. And the probability of success, we'll grab our cell reference up there as well. And we wanted exactly 58 successes, so we want the false. You can double click false, or you can type in uh, zero. And that works out, and let's put this in percent again. I like to go with two decimals, 7.42%. Okay, so pretty straightforward as long as you know what to enter into the binomial formula. Let's move along. B, no more than 65 successes. Let's say this. Uh, okay, how do we set that up? Well, we know we're using binom dist, and we know our, our threshold number is 65. Our trials is again 100. Our probability is again 0.6. And now we want to go cumulative or not. Now we want to go to cumulative because we're looking at the the probability of 65 and everything underneath it. So now we could we could put punch in true or put the number one. It gives us the same thing, and we see that's 86.97 percent. Moving right along, C, less than 70 successes. 
Okay, how do we want to set that up? Binom dist number is 70. Number of successes, trials is again 100. Cumulative uh, probability is still 0.6. And because we're less than, we're thinking about everything up to and, and just not including 70. So we're going to want to go with that um, that true. This time I'll type in the word true. 98.52. Now, actually, I need to fix this because I just realized what I did there. I technically put in less than or equal to 70 successes. And uh, we don't want less than or equal to. We want strictly less than. There's an easy fix for that, though. I just realized this. Um, what's less than 70? 69. So if we just use the value of 69... And presuming that uh, you know these can only occur in integer outcomes, if we just type in 69, that'll that'll give us the result for less than 70. Okay, so moving along, at least 59 successes. 59. Okay, this one I want to think about the uh, the distribution, which remember is basically a normal shape distribution. We're talking about the probability of at least 59 successes. We want to draw the mean of our distribution. Our our base rate, our p, was 60%, and our our n number of trials was 100. So what's our expected value of x? Well, it's 60% of a, of 100. It's 60. So our mean here is 60. And remember, it's we have an n that's um, large. We have a p that's somewhere in the middle. So we can assume it's normally distributed, even though it's binomial. And we're saying, what's the probability of greater than 59, which is right next here. Let me change colors. Right next here to the mean. But we're looking at the probability to the right of that rather than to the left, which is what we've been looking at before. We've been thinking about this probability, the area under the curve here. Well, what is it, the cumulative probability, remember, is 1. This should be really familiar to us when we, we did this with normals last time. So. What we want to do to find the probability on the other side of that is just say what is 1 minus the probability of being greater than, I'm sorry, I should have said 1 minus the probability of being you know, uh, less than 59. And that will give us the probability of being greater than 59. So that's how we want to set this one up. So back to Excel, and we'll, put, we'll set it up like this, equals 1 minus... binom dist and then we'll put our number of 59 we're less than or equal to so we use the whole number the number of trials is 100 the probability is 6 and if yes we want to be cumulative again so we'll stay with true or 1 and oh I forgot a parenthesis Excel added it in there for me I'm looking at my uh, my master key here and I realized I'm wrong because it's not e greater than or equal to it's actually just equal to so uh, the simple fix for that I want to just change that to 58 and 62.25 is exactly what we're supposed to get okay the next one E says greater than 65 successes now we're strictly greater than but because we're greater than we're going to still have the uh, 1 minus convention so that's binom dot dist 1 minus binom dist uh, the number of successes we want to be strictly greater than, so we'll go ahead with 65. The number of trials is 100. Probability again, 0.6. Cumulative, yes. And then let me make sure I put enough parentheses on there. And there we go, 13.03%. F, between 55 and 65 successes, inclusive. That one's going to be a little trickier. Between 55 and 65 successes inclusive. How do we want to set that up? Well, let's go back to the drawing pad. Now we're thinking about what we need to do is identify the probability of getting less than 65. Okay, we know how to do that, so we'll find the probability of getting less than 65. That'll be this green area under the curve. But then we'll say we want to exclude from that the probability of getting less than 55 and strictly less than this. So we want to subtract out that area. So we want to find the one under 65. So that'll be the binome dist for 65. And then subtract from that the binome dist uh, for 55. So let's see if we can do that. Equals binome dist for 65. 100 trials, 60% cumulative. Close the parentheses and now say minus binome 
dot dist for 54. We want to be strictly less than 55. 100 trials, 60%, and once again, true, or we could type in 1. 73.86% are going to occur between the values here, 55 and 65. And uh, let's just kind of pause on that and see, does that make sense in relation to in com uh, consideration of our empirical rules? Well, if we calculated our standard deviation here, we've, we've got our, our mean. Let's calculate, let's go ahead and calculate the standard deviation. Remember, that is the square root of our base rate, which is n times p, or our, um, our mean, rather, um, times 1 minus p. So that's going to be square root of uh, 60 times 1 minus our p would be 0.4. So I'll just grab a calculator, and I'm going to take 60 times 0.4. 24. I'm going to take the square root of 24, 4.89. Let's call that 4.9. So 64.9, that's right about there at 65. And then 55.1 uh, is uh, plus and, whoops, 4.9 is plus and minus one sigma. So a slightly smaller area, and my empirical rule said that would include 68%. We've broadened that out just a hair on each side, and our calculation told us that we got a cumulative percent of 73, 74 percent. So, yeah, pretty close, right? Pretty close to what we would expect. Remember, the binomial only approximates um, normal distribution, but but that's kind of in the ballpark of what we would expect. So, so that kind of checks out if we just think about the logic of the empirical rules and how the binomial works in the same same manner as the normal. Okay, a couple more of these, and we'll move on to one final practice problem. G says exactly 40 failures. Exactly 40 failures. Ah, failures. We can handle this easily as long as we don't get caught. Up, as long as we don't make a uh, common mistake here. Okay, the number of successes. Let's just redefine successes, failures as successes. 40. Trials is still 100. Now we'll change the probability though. If the probability of success is 0.4, that means a 0.6 rather. That means the probability of failure is 0.4. I'll just manually enter that, and then. Do we want to be cumulative? Uh, no, we're looking at exactly 40 failures, so we want to enter the 0 or false. And we get 8.12%. H says at least 35 failures. So, okay, at least 35 failures. Now this one's a little tricky. So says what is the probability of at least no, greater than or equal to 35 failures. Well, let's map out our cumulative distribution here with mean of 60 successes, which is 40 failures. Okay. Now here we go up in successes and, and down in failures. So to get to 35 failures, that would be 65 successes, wouldn't it? Because our total n is 100. So I'm saying I want to have that at least that many successes. I'm in, uh, failures rather, and failures are increasing as I go to the left, so I'm thinking about the area under the curve from 65 successes to the left. Well, um, the book's actually recommending we do something else, but we we actually already did this, didn't we? Yeah, wouldn't we do that in part B? At least 65 successes is the same, same thing as at least 35 failures, so it's going to work out to binom dist 65 100, 0.6, and 1, 86.97%, which matches up there. So the probability of at least 35 failures is the same thing as at least 65 successes. Okay, and finally, I, less than 42 failures. Well, here we can just do the simple thing of defining failure as success and using the failure probability in the in the binom distribution function. We want strictly less than, so we'll pick the number to the left of that, 41, out of the 100 trials. But again, no, we're not going to use the 0.6. That's a probability for successes. We'll use the 0.4, which is probability for failures. Or if you like, we can actually define that as 1 minus the probability. We can do that in our head or have Excel do it for us. And then we want it to be cumulative 
so we'll go with true. Oops. Um, we want it to be cumulative, so we put one or true. Okay, I le once again left off a parenthesis, 62.25%. Okay, and the final thing it says find the 90th percentile, 95th percentile of the distribution of x. The book wants us to start with the trial and error method, which is kind of useful to see what the process is. We're just kind of going back to our distribution and thinking about what value here 95% of all possibilities occur to the left of. Well, it's somewhere above 65, isn't it? Because we know that's our that's our 68% cutoff. That's our one sigma. So if we start at 65 and just start entering numbers, values that go up one at a time, 65, 66, 67, and, and so on, and then run the cumulative probability distribution. This is basically the same thing we just did when we looked at uh, created the cumulative uh, function for the free throw problem. What we're going to do is our binome distribution. The number of successes is now defined by our, that cell. The number of successes is the cell reference. The number of trials I want to lock in b dollar sign three, and the probability of success I also want to lock in at b dollar sign four, and then we want true. We want a cumulative distribution function. Close it down. And let's have it, let's display it as a percentage with a couple decimals. And we basically keep running this until we cross 95, and we haven't yet at 67, so let me add a couple, three more values here, and then keep doing this. And we'll see, yeah, we did. So we crossed it somewhere between 67 and 68. So we could actually find it just kind of by, by this um, rote process. But of course, we you know we can also enter the inverse binom inverse function. We can once again dial in our values, 100 trials, probability, and then our alpha, our critical threshold value, which is 0.95, and it tells us it's 68. That's just basically any, a quicker and easier way to find that percentile. So the 95th percentile, we know by using the inverse binomial distribution function, is at a value of 98. That means 98, 95% of all occurrences are going to be at a success rate of 68 or less. Okay, and finally, example 5.9, daily sales at a supermarket, and I'm on page uh, 197. If you want to follow along, grab the book. And it says this, customers at a supermarket spend varying amounts. Historical data indicate that the amount spent per customer is normally distributed with mean 85 and standard deviation 30. And let's go ahead and start setting this up. And we'll enter those facts, amount, and then it says if 500 customers shop in a given day, calculate the mean and standard deviation of the number who spend at least $100. Then calculate the probability that at least 30% of all customers spend at least $100. So we want to find the probability that a customer spends at least greater than or equal to $100. Well, how are we going to work that out? Let's uh, think about that in terms of our, our normal distribution again. So we've got a normal distribution of shoppers with mean spending $85 and the sigma is 30. So if we go one sigma, that would be 85 plus 30, that would be 115. That's one sigma. And if we go 85 minus 30, that would be 55. And we know 68% is in here, and yeah, we can go two sigma and everything else. So normal distribution. We want to say, what's the probability the customer spends at least 100? Well, 100 occurs somewhere. Let me change colors. 100 occurs about right here. We want to say, what's the probability of, of at least that? So that plus, so that's this area under the curve here. Okay, how would we achieve that? Well, if we uh, said norm distribution for, for 100, that would give us the probability to the left of that. And then what the remaining probability over here? So we could just say one minus norm distribution for 100, and then we could you know punch in the value of the um, the mean, the standard deviation, everything else, and then that'll give us the the percentage of people who are out here in this tail. So that's exactly what we'll do. We've, we're f very familiar with this from last time. So let's go ahead and do that. Equals one minus norm.dist x was 100 critical value our mean we can use cell reference 85 
our standard deviation, cell reference again of 30, and we want to be uh, true or one cumulative. I forgot a parenthesis on the end again. And the probability value we get is 30, 0.309, 30.9% of customers are spending at least $100 a day. Okay, so we found the probability of a customer spending um, at least $100. And now we basically can set up a binomial model and we're saying there's there's two outcomes in the binomial model. Customers in group A, which spends more than 100, or at least 100, or group B, which doesn't. Or success could be defined as spending at least 100, failure uh, not spending at least 100. Find the mean and standard deviation of proportion of them that spend at least $100 using a binomial distribution. So the mean, of course, is simply the uh, the, the number of trials, if you will, the number of customers times our base rate probability that we calculated with using, using a normal distribution assumption. So 154.27. And the standard deviation, remember, in the binomial distribution is the square root of the, the mean, which is the probability times n, which we just did, times 1 minus the probability. So what we're saying is the number of customers who spend at least $100 per day is binomially distributed with mean 154, standard deviation 10.3. Okay, so now the problem's asking us, what's the probability that at least 30% of all 500 daily customers spend at least $100? And to think about that, let's go back to a um, graph of the distribution. So I've drawn out the distribution of, I'm calling them $100 plus shoppers, n equals 500, p equals uh, 309. We calculated the sigma and everything, so we know that 68% are within 144 to 164, sigma was 10. And we're basically saying this, what are the chances that 30%, it's a probability of 30% of the 500 being in this group? Well, 30% of 500, 0.3 times 500, is 150. So we're basically saying, what are the chances that this is going to work out in practice to 150 or more, greater than at least 30%, so strictly greater than 150? Well, 150 occurs right in here. And we want to say, what are the chances that we're dealing with an outcome that's strictly greater than that? I'm sorry, great, it's actually greater than or equal to that, so we want to include 150. So in order to include 150, we'll just notch it one mark to the left, which will be 149. So we'll say, what's what's the probability of an outcome of 149 or more, at, at least 149, um, spending $100 or more? So that's this area here to the right of 149, which I've colored in in red. Now, we're dealing with areas to the left typically, but that's okay. The area remaining to the left here if we subtract that from 1, that'll yield the area to the right. So what we want to do when we set up this problem is say, what's 1 minus the binomial distribution of, you know, basically 149, and then all of these assumptions that we just calculated about the, um, distrib the binomial distribution of $100 plus shoppers. So we jump back into Excel, we can probably make that work. So let's type in what we're looking for. Probability... So the probability of at least 30% spending at least $100. And the way we're going to work that out, 1 minus binom distribution. The number of successes, remember, we could, um, let's just type in, we already calculated at 149, you know, gr greater than that. Um, and then the number of trials, that is our number of, customers. The probability is the th roughly 31% probability we calculated already for $100 plus customers. And then we want to go with uh, one true cumulative. And we get about 68%. And we can express that indeed as a percent. So about 68%, precisely speaking, 67.6% .6 of our customers spend at least $100. Actually, the probably 67.6% chance that at least 30% of our customers on any given day are going to spend the $100.
Okay, so there's some practice and warm up with binomial distribution. A little tricky, I know, but it's uh, similar to what we've done with normal distribution. So if we can just wrap our heads around the, the things they have in common, I think we'll get the hang of it. We'll stop now, though, but uh, we'll come back soon enough with some uh, with the homework problems for this chapter, the continuation of Chapter 5. I think I have about three that we'll do all together, and then two that you'll be able to do all by yourself.